I'll start with just a brief, um, very basic introduction into phylogenetics and, and building trees, and then we'll transition in over to Sean, who will give you, hopefully we'll transition smoothly into, into how we, we do phylogeography upon those trees, in particular how we do it in, in Pangea. So first, what is, what is a tree and why are we interested in trees? Well, phylogenetics help us to model the, the unobserved past, and so we start with our samples which are shown here as, as circles just out in space. And what we really want to know is how these samples relate to each other um, genetically and, and, and through time. And so again, just here are the samples. These are the sequences that we have from, from individual cases um, represented as external nodes or, or tips on the phylogeny. Um, these nodes here are internal nodes. They're common ancestors um, of the samples. And so this one here you can see represents a common ancestor of these two blue samples up here, whereas this one represents a common ancestor of these two green. And so we would say that the two blue samples are more closely related to each other than they are to any of the other samples because they have a common ancestor. They, they share a common ancestor here before they share one um, with all of the other samples in the tree. Um, and they would, they would share their common ancestor with the rest of the samples is back here um, at the root of the tree. We usually estimate the tree using um, genetics and, and the branches represent genetic distance or the genetic similarity between, between the samples. But ideally we wanna place the tree in time because we wanna be able to compare the tree and put it in context of, of other events that are happening in time like, like case counts um, and, and introductions to different regions. And then finally, once we have this tree, something that Sean will touch on um, later is we wanna be able to, um, to color the tree and to, to estimate where these ancestral nodes are. Um, so if you imagine each color represents a location um, on a map, we want to know what the ancestral nodes are and their relationship to, to the samples. We want to know when they are, where they fall in time, and we want to have some estimation of, of where they are. So this right here would indicate that, that we started in the blue region and then that transmitted over to the green, which then transmitted to the red, and that can give us an indication of how um, HIV in this case is, is moving between communities. When we're, we're building a tree, we start with a genetic alignment, and, and that's shown here as a, as a string of nucleotides. We have three samples labeled one, two, and three. Um, each column in this alignment is, is assumed to be, to be a comparable site, and so you can see that sample one has two mutations here compared to, to samples two and three. Sample two has a, a unique mutation here, and sample three has a unique mutation in this column of the alignment. And so we wanna be able to take this information in the alignment and, and somehow represent it as a tree. Um, one way to sort of, to start wrapping your head around, around what we're doing is to build a distance matrix between, between the samples in the alignment. And this is, was one of the early ways of building trees. And there are a number of different ways to, to calculate genetic distance. Some take into account um, the fact that Certain types of substitutions are more common than others, um, but the simplest way is just to count the number of differences, and that's what I've done here. So you can see we have three mutations, or three differences between samples one and two. That would be one, two, and three here. And we have another three between one and three, the same one, two, and, and now here, three, and then two differences between samples two and three, which would be located right here. And so we can build a tree, um, to represent the relationship between these samples. Now, since there's only three, it's a, um, a trivial tree. The topology here is um, very straightforward, but we, we wanna have branch lengths here that represent the genetic distance because that's a representation of, of what we have in the sequence alignment. And so if we compare, right, the distance between one and three, we want this length here to be, to be cl as close to three as we can. Um, the same thing for, for this distance between, between one and two, and then, similarly between two and three. Now again, because there's three tips, this is, this is trivial to do. Um, but once we get more samples, um, there becomes different structure in the tree and it becomes harder to weigh, to weigh these differences and, and you can't always do it as perfectly as you can here. So this is just a very um, simple and straightforward way um, of representing the data and showing the tree. A more complex way and one that we use in Pangea um, is to have a model for nucleotide substitution. And this would be a maximum likelihood approach. And so we have some, some model that represents a, a rate of change between the different nucleotides. Um, the simplest one would be the same, the same rate between all of them, but you can do go up as complex as, 
as there are arrows on the screen here. Um, and then what we do is we have our, our tree like we had before, labeled again one, two, and three, and we're gonna take the columns in the alignment and we'll go column by column. And we're trying to find branch lengths and topologies that, that make the changes that we observe most likely given, given the rate of change between, between these nucleotides. And so we start at the first column, it's, it's easy. We have A's here at every sample. And then we have this internal node where we're not sure what, what the base was in this case. So it could be any of these three, um, or any of these four nucleotides here. Now, if it's pretty easy to look at this and, and to assume that that's probably an A there as long as these changes are happening slowly. We have a similar case with the, with the next couple sites. And then you can see we have this mutation, right, where, where one has a different base and the other two. And so this would suggest um, probably that there was a mutation here along this branch um, between, between T and C or C and T. We don't know the direction at this case. And we can do this across all of the, all of the columns in the alignment. And we're trying to find the tree that, that makes all of these columns the happiest given, given our chosen model of substitution. And now we're also interested, right, in, the, in where these samples are and how, and how nucleotides change across the tree, but also how locations change across the tree. And so in an analogous method, we can include um, an extra column in the alignment that represents location. So here I have um, New York and Florida, and you can have some rate of change where, where Florida transitions to New York and vice versa. And you can include that in your calculations of the tree and begin to estimate maybe where, where was this node? Was it more likely that it was in Florida than, um, than New York? And this is all very useful for seeing how samples relate to each other, but remember we're, we want to be able to put this in time. And if we're going to put it in time, then that means that we have to pick um, a place to start on the tree. So now I'm showing the same tree, it's drawn a little bit differently, and I have the years that the samples were taken. Um, and this is the internal node we had on the last slide, and this yellow node here is the root. So this is our starting point. And if we start here and build a tree now directionally, we end up with a tree like this. So again, here's the root here. And as we move down towards the number one tip, we're moving um, over here to this, moving down this branch moves us to this internal node. And so you can see how, how this is really the same tree. It's just a different representation of it. And it's drawn now in a representation that implies directionality. So we're starting at the root and time is, well, I guess evolution is moving from left to write, and one question we want to know is, does that match time and what we would expect given time? Are the mutations accumulating according to some constant rate? And one way to see that is if you plot the divergence here against um, the amount of time between the samples. So the divergence is just measuring the distance from the root. Um, and if we plot that up to time, because this is um, a made, made up tree, it's a very good correlation here between time and, and divergence. And you can now see that we have this um, nice rate of substitutions accumulating on the tree. And so that allows us to take the branch lengths here that represent genetic distance and, and scale them into time. And now start to, to, um, to compare where these internal nodes are in time and, and space. So, so briefly what I've done over here is, is building a time tree through a maximum likelihood approach where we start with an, an alignment. We have some substitution model on the genetic data as well as the location data. We build our tree based on genetic distance um, and then we can find the route that best allows us to scale that tree into time and end up with some representation of how, how the virus has been moving between communities. One drawback on this method is that building these large trees is difficult. It's difficult to, to find the, the best tree, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the tree. There are a number of trees often that are just as good um, as the best tree. And so one way to incorporate in that into our analysis is to use a Bayesian approach. Um, and this is something Sean will touch on as well. And in this method, we take our sequence data and we take our genetic data and we um, use them both at the same time to estimate a tree in, in beast. And what we end up with is a collection of trees, reasonable trees that reasonably represent um, the data that we put in. And then we look at summary statistics across those trees um, to look for trends that um, at where introductions are coming from and when they're coming from, um, and so forth. Okay, I um, hope you can all hear me. Um, thanks to JT for assisting me with the introduction. 
Um, I'm just going to speak a bit more about um, phylogenetics in terms of the pen, in terms of Pangaea context, and what work has been done here. Um, so a little bit more about the data set. Um, currently, what I'm working on is around about just under twenty-seven thousand Pangaea records, um, around about ten thousand pop art records, and some records taken from the Los Alamos um, um, database as a background sequence, um, just to put the Pangaea and pop art sequences in context. Um, so uh, just as JT was um, explaining in the introduction session, the um, procedure is a bit more complex. Um, so what we are doing, trying to do is quite to create a method um, to analyze the Pangea data set. And we have to go all the way back from the actual records from the database and how to put all of that into alignment. And then from the alignment to a tree and then from a tree to a time tree and then get some um, models and estimations. Um, so this is basically a general a pipeline that currently we are creating um, with some parts has already been completed. So it will be split into three sections, um, basically the manipulation and alignment where we have all the records from the database and then move it all the way to alignment. Um, and then from alignment to creating a tree and then doing phylogenetics analysis on that. And also, you could choose to directly use uh, BEAST, which is a Bayesian phylogenetic uh, anal uh, analytical tool. So a bit more in detail um, on all of this. Uh, basically, for the alignment, we'll be extracting these records from the Pangea database. And then we um, do some filtering um, based on uh, if the metadata that we require for further downstream phylogenetic analysis, if these metadata are missing or not, um, uh, or um, if these sequences are um, long, long enough, so um, the missing bases, uh, what are the quality of these sequ sequences and so on. Um, these can all be um, classified by the actual user depending on what you really need. And then we all wanted to annotate these sequences um, to the closest reference. In this case, we extracted um, well-defined strains from the Los Alamos database as references. And then we all subtype them as well as annotate them. Um, and then we can also extract regions of interest um, from these sequences, for instance, the gag, pole, and inf um, regions. Um, and then we can align these regions into alignment, which is ready to, um, to build trees on or do phylogenetic analysis. Um, and in, um, on this um, pipeline, we have all different tools to be able to do this. Okay, and then moving on to building trees. Um, the initial um, tool kits that we were using was the Augur Auspice tool, which is the tool behind Next Strain. Um, basically, what Olga Auspice does is it's a, uh, a complete tool that takes in alignment or even you can take in raw sequences and create the alignment for you uh, using MAFT. And then from the alignment, um, or you can give it alignment, just like the one that I've already created based on the alignment phase of my pipeline. Um, it takes in the alignment and then uh, creates a ML tree and then further on it, you can refine this ML, uh, raw ML tree into a timed tree um, um, just like uh, what JT was explaining in his introduction by inferring the sampling dates as well as different traits by um, doing uh, ancestral reconstruction and then you have a final tree with all of these traits and then these can be then further viewed by auspice. Um, and here is an example of what you would you or what you will be getting um, um, from all of that. So this is a subset of um, the main data, data set that we extracted by using different parameters. 
Um, so after all of that, we basically extracted around about 11,000 uh, poll genes from um, Pangaea, Hopart, as well as um, the Los Alamos database. And we gone from just having the raw, data, uh, the raw records and then going through the pipeline, going through Augur and finally represented in Auspice. It's pretty much quite automated through that pipeline. Um, this is nowhere close to a complete um, result. So it's just a test from um, a default parameterization of Augur as well as the alignment. Um, so here we can have um, the refine tree and from the refine tree we can plot it onto a geographical map to see what is the movement um, after the ancestral reconstruction of each node and uh, from the nodes to the tips. Um, and then we can see all of that in terms of movement in terms of the map. Okay. Um, or we can choose to use another method, which um, we are planning to move on to because there are some um, more final um, details with regards to the problems with Augur, um, but we can discuss that um, if everyone's interested in the discussions, um, but we want to replace that with Beast, uh, where there are several more um, advantages in using this um, method. Um, uh, but mainly, um, the main issue with Beast at the moment, where we are not going directly to it, is of course there is computational issues as well as other complex um, um, model testing and all of that in terms of using this method on large data sets, uh, which we have here at Pangaea. Um, and we are currently testing. Um, our workaround method initially where BEAST was uh, um, in terms of computational time, BEAST was okay in analyzing around about 6,000 sequences, but adding more to that, it becomes more computation intensive. So uh, we are working on a more of a bolt around way um, in creating a beast pipeline to analyze large data sets where we are using currently multi-tree beast, um, which I'll give more in detail results um, next week. Um, but um, so basically we'll be collapsing the, um, the data set into smaller clusters and then um, running beast in parallel on each of these clusters using um, one uh, coalescent model and um, one uh, fix, uh, one clock rate um, for the, all the data sets. Um, the advantage of, of this, uh, instead of only computational um, efficiency, is also that we are able to also zoom into individual clusters to have better tree resolution and tree accuracy. Um, so, and more on beast. Um, beast is. Um, the, another advantage of Beast is that we were able, uh, you're able to have more flexibility in choosing different types of models in estimating um, or, or doing the final dynamic analysis on these trees. Um, and uh, we, in this, um, we can see here that we are inferring the, um, uh, the loc location trait in this case. Um, based on different uh, geographical location. And then by using ancestral construction, we can see that from one area to another, we can also estimate the, uh, the rates from one location to another. And then using these rate matrices, we can then estimate, um, for instance, um, sources and sinks and migration and um, these um, uh, can test these kind of hypotheses. Um, so um, another advantage is this, well, basically Bayesian uh, methods allows us to have a posterior um, distribution to um, have a better estimation of, or better look at how well you are inferencing these trees um, by having a more of a statistical, a statistical measure in terms of a posterior distribution. And um, on the red dots, we know that these are tips that we got. So we have a posterior one, they're absolute. And then we have different colors on the tips, I mean, on the, uh, on the, um, on the branches and the nodes to have a better representation of how confident you are with regards to these um, phylogenetic trees. 
So basically, that is a basic run through of what the current Pangea pipeline um, currently entails and what we are trying to build um, in trying to analyze the whole Pangea data set. And from all of this, um, we will be able to analyze Pangea data as a whole and then um, using that uh, result to make more inferences on what um, initially are the aims of um, Pangea. So um, I would like to bring that to, uh, to an end to my session and um, I'm happy to, to take in any questions.